Hello, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Production House Podcast, where I will be chatting with the hidden heroes of dance music culture and the people that are the glue of operations behind the scenes. My name's Stretch, so if you're sitting comfortably, then let me begin. Hello and welcome to the Production House Podcast at number 13. I misnumbered last last time's podcast, but this is lucky number 13 on the 16th of May 2023, and I can't believe I've finally got a chance. My guest today is Ed Ovendown, CEO of Fearmon and uh, absolute legend of the rave game. Edo, <laughs> thanks for coming down, brother. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, look, I'm not going to cut any corners because we've got only an hour to kind of squeeze everything in. Tell me where it all began for you. Well, if I, you know, let's uh, let's start, you know, from from where it gets interesting. Let's put it that way, which is obviously when when the music came into it. And it's ironic that I'm sitting here with you because you're a legend to me, and you're actually living that same moment. You know, we're we'll getting parallel into lives. parallel lives. But um, yeah, the main thing for me when it started, really, in terms of you know what I do. Till till this day was uh, mid nineties when I was in uh, I was in living in London at the time, I was uh, training to be a journalist. That was sort of my my dream at the time, and then basically I started you know going out as you would in the late nineties in London, and uh, invariably ended up at Metalheads, drum and bass, Goldie, the Blue Note, and it was like seminal night of London. You know, it was just the most amazing, uh, innovative sounds. I mean, you had you know obviously. Goldie there, Groove Rider, uh, you know, all the big DJs of the time. But you also had, you know, I mean, Chemical Brothers would be hanging out there, you know, everyone. Bjork. Bowie, Bjork Bowie in the corner. Bowie in the corner. It was yeah. crazy, you know. And it was me and my best friend, Oliver. We were just having a time of our lives, you know. We were like early 20s, you know, sipping our, 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 our beers and having a little smoke and just absorbing this amazing music, which is like, felt like every week it was just more innovative and it was just advancing so quickly and you just felt like you were part of something really unique and and it was at that time you know which was the the late 90s and the you know what i still think is like the heyday of drum and bass in terms of you know quality and innovation but anyway so we were just really inspired and i just started really digging into music i've always been into it i i was i was a drummer when i was a, since very young since i was 10 rhythm master rhythm master so like percussion, drums was all, so when I actually started discovering Eamon Brothers, you know, drum and bass, I was like, fuck, this is this is for me. Mm. This is all about beats and drums, you know. Um so anyway, just of course just started really getting into the whole London scene. And then me and my friend Oliver, we just had this bright idea one day, like, yeah, let's let's do a night, you know, let's let's do like a jazzy drum and bass night. So we started knocking on some doors, we knocked up at uh Ronnie Scott's jazz club. They had a little space upstairs. Of course, we had no money, so we couldn't get we couldn't get a gig, right? I mean, we couldn't get a venue. And then one night, we were at actually uh, a night in London called PM Scientists, and um, you know, which was I think it was a Wednesday night. And um, and I remember, Soho, right? yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And we were there one night, and I and I saw this guy, a guy called Chris Greenwood. He was the he was like the venue. Um, manager for a lot of different venues in London and I saw him and I could just tell uh, and I've always had this thing I could just you know I could tell he was looking around so I, you know I had a few drinks I went up to him Chris hey, how are you doing uh, and cut long story short he was like yeah I want to do drum and bass night at Bar Rumba and that was a great venue still is um, so I said oh really well that's funny you should say that because like you know we're planning on uh, we've got a night you know I didn't have anything just blagging it I've just absolutely blagging it yeah. he's like okay interesting send me a proposal tomorrow so then i oliver was there i said mate i think we can get a night you know just met chris greenwood so basically the next day um in the meantime i'd actually started a fanzine as well in london because obviously i was into journalism uh it was called miles ahead it was a fanzine that you know we produced we sold it in all the record stores and through that i'd built an amazing network in London. So I knew all the, you know, labels, Renegade Hardware. Uh, Dave Stone had his label at the time. Um, you know, there's a lot of players, obviously, you know, um, in the scene and, and other scenes, all, you know, house, techno, everything that was going on. Um, so through that network, you know, we we called up Dave Stone at the time. We had a, 
a big label, um, and and he had he was close connected with Brian G, you know, who just sort of pretty much started V Records. And uh, long story short, you know, we said to Dave, "Hey, we've got this venue, um, and what have you got?" He's like, "Well, you know, I'm close with Brian G." And they got the whole Bristol gang connected and it's just starting to pop a little bit. You know, Ronnie Size, all crust, DJ Die. So I said, well, great, let's just put it together. And let's. so we basically, in 24 hours, put a little plan together. Obviously, I was just starting, so I got, me and Oliver got a terrible deal <laughs> for ourselves. <laughs> we got shafted. <laughs> but we were like, fuck it, this is amazing. And uh, so we took it to Chris and he's like, yeah, let's go. And uh, And at the time, I was actually doing some freelancing at, Time Out magazine, Dave Swindells in the it's club t- section. Shout out to Dave Swindells. Shout out to Dave Swindells, legend. And of course, at that time, Time Out magazine was like it's everything. Essential. I mean, essential. everyone looked at the top five like recommendations. It was the so guide, wasn't it? The yeah. guide to London, yeah. So when I turned up one day to work, I said, Dave, I'm starting a club. He's like, all right, I'll give you a, I'll give you a shout out. You know. So basically, our first night was just roadblock. And honestly, with like all humility, never we back. never look back. No, very true. It was just the perfect time with the perfect artist, the perfect sound, on a perfect night, Thursday night. It was just, you know, it was really cheap. It was like four or five quid to get in Ramajam for literally 10 years. And the name. Movement, yeah. It was just, yeah. it, was, it just hit. It, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't get in many times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that was it. And we, you know, it wasn't, we, there was no master plan. There wasn't no business plan. There wasn't plan. It wasn't. There was nothing. It was just all like. How long did it run for? It ran for more than ten years. In the end, I mean, yeah. towards the end of it, I'd I'd gone to Brazil, which is another part of the story. But, but yeah, no, it ran like over ten years. So uh, and uh, yeah, it became you know we did. We had it was record. the front line for the jazzy for the jazzy yeah. jump basically, and of it the was day, like it? you know when uh, Ronnie Size won the Mercury Music Prize was on a Thursday and after that everyone came down to the club you know Frost Brian G the whole gang I think we had about 100 bottles of champagne that night you know? <laughs> made no money all out of your pocket <laughs> uh, all out of our pocket but we had the time of our lives I mean and, and everyone used to come down there you know Nana Cherry Prince came down I mean you name it people knew in London Bar that Rumble. was the place yeah. to go yeah. if you wanted something that was really underground and cool you know and even Eminem came down you know, and celebrities would sort of turn up and be like, oh, "Is there a VIP section?" We'd be like, "There's no VIP no, section mate. here, mate." It's Under like, the stairs, point. yeah. It's like <laughs> Under you can, the stairs, bro. <laughs> you can get in, you can get in the booth, yeah, <laughs> if they'll let you in. No, you don't want to go in there. But you know, but yeah, it wasn't. It was just a different time, wasn't it? It was all really about the music. It was just, you know, the the sound system had to be right, and yeah, people just just really had an amazing time. So, so that was in a, you know, that was a real privilege and a kind of a lucky i mean lucky is not you know we worked hard for it but yeah being at the right place and you know i always tell people it's like because there was what, people don't people don't realize there was so much going on in london at that time yeah. as well wasn't it no, to it was. be fair they was you know we you know with awol um uh metal heads uh rage you know the under, it was quite funny because just before the podcast started we was talking about you know the commercial side, yeah, and it was sort of anti wanting to be commercial, but at the same time, it yeah. was actually probably the most popular music, yeah, in London especially. No, it was for the underground, yeah, and I think that's where we positioned it as a bit as well. Unknowingly, we also made it accessible to a other crowd that might not feel comfortable going to certain raves and stuff. You know, that was definitely there. And I saw that in the mix of the crowd. But that also made movement special because you had, you know, your South London crew, you coolest got so a harder crew. All you got, you had some, there. like, posh chicks in there. You got had everything. But it all blended together and it all worked out. We never, never really had fights, you know, it was... People just coming down and having a great time. So, so that was amazing. You know, yeah. we you know the first few years was just unbelievable experience. And then, you know, we were like, within a short time, we were flying to New York every month, doing a night at Twilo. We we're doing um, Bagley's. You know, selling it out. Um, all the stuff when Fabric opened. You know, the Rileys asked me and all of us to help them. You know, work on design ideas. So we were involved in that from the beginning. The fir- very first night 
at Fabric was Planet V, Drum and Bass Night. And we, um, Oliver and me, we were, we were so aggressive as promoters that I remember till this day, like on the day, the queue was like ridiculous. And the Rileys called me into the room and said, you've over-promoted this night. I'm like, how do you mean <laughs> over-promote? There's too many people outside. I'm like, well, I just did my job, mate. He's like, if I lose my fucking license because of you, you've had it, you know. So I'm there like, all right, this is the day I die. <laughs> the true story. I was sitting in the- And it's quite funny because that, that Farringdon scenario, we had, yeah. I was working in the post office in the King Edward building just on the other side. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you used to go through the meat market. <laughs> yes. And the, the, it was buzzing from the meat market. The pubs, the pubs were open at like three o'clock in the mornings and we're closing at 11 o'clock in the morning when all the meat market was, yeah. was already closed down. So the, the, it was constantly, constantly busy throughout the week. And then on the Saturday night was all of a sudden was quiet yeah. and then fabric was established. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you have this whole yeah. ascending new, yeah. yeah, it was, there was a lot of noise that yeah. was made when, when, when fabric arose. I mean, still to this day, it's no, one of the best clubs in the no, world. Unbelievable. And yeah. we, you know, we did a, a lot of different nights there and, you know, a great time. Obviously, the Mass in in uh, Brixton, Brixton yeah. which we did every month. Oh, so, yeah. you know, at some point... They were great parties. And, and then we even did... We even had a night on Fridays. There was a club on Leicester Square. I can't remember the name now. It was one of the cream guys that opened it. It was a very commercial club, but we had, like, a drum and bass room. James Barton? No, it wasn't his part, ex-partner. Jim, Jim King. I think so, yeah. Anyway, at one point, Oliver, me, and obviously the movement team, it was a, it was a, a good team of people. I mean, we were doing li- literally like Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, and it was just all-consuming. You know, it was an amazing experience, um, but it was very, very intense, you know? Yeah. And, and the whole, you know, the whole politics, the drum and bass, and managing all of that, that was, uh, that was, this wasn't a better university for me, like in terms of, you know, managing and, dealing in that business because quite frankly if you can you know walk into drum and bass jungle in the 90s come out of it you know unscathed unscathed <laughs> then you're you know winning. then you're winning you know and so uh, i've definitely i mean i i owe a lot to you know brian and frost and a lot of people there you know right groove rider it's one in, in the end yeah in one the end family. in the end like at the beginning obviously we oliver and me were like new newbies young kids but i think they saw like okay these boys have got appetite and they get, you know, they gave us the opportunity, like, okay, take that opportunity, and then we would go and maximize it. And they'd be like, okay, do this. And by the end, we were running the labels, we were running the merchandise companies, we were running everything, you know. Yeah. Um, with them at the forefront, we loved being in the in the in the background, you know. But um, but yeah, and then I think a big sort of transition moment was also late nineties when I met DJ Markey and Pachief. And uh, I'd grown up in South America as a kid, so I had a very strong connection with South America and definitely with Brazil. You know, my dad was always playing bossa nova and, and Brazilian music in our house, and I was, you know, obsessed with with football. So also that was, you know, when I was a kid, I went to see... LA, like, for those who don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, I went to see, like, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Brazil. Wow. I saw some big matches wow. my dad would take me wow to like the i lived in uruguay he'd take me to the Stadio centenario which is like the big stadium there so that was in my blood you know and and so i mean it was literally one day oliver and me were sitting in the office and i get this random f- phone call from this guy called adrian harley still a great friend he's now a big dog in in uh, facebook music latin stuff but anyway so adrian calls me and he was an english guy who'd was doing had been doing like some charity work in in the favelas in brazil and had met marking pachief and uh and because he spoke english he called up said oh yeah i'm adrian you know i'm I'm with these guys from brazil who don't speak english um and they'd like to do movement in sao paulo and oliver being oliver he's you know oliver's like he's like what do you mean you're not doing movement in sao paulo what are you talking about you know, but I was, but when I heard him say Brazil, like, give me the phone, literally. And I went over, I grabbed the phone and I was like, and again, it was that thing in my head that I've had in my life a few times where it's like opportunity, boom. You know, I, 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 I sense it and my mind goes a million miles an hour. So I was already, anyway, long story short. So Pachief, he goes to a loan shark 
in Sao Paulo, borrows money and <laughs> takes a flight, takes a flight oh, wow. okay. to, to London. Because I said, prove it that you want it. Come here. And literally turns up two days later with a video cassette. It turns up at our office, Adrian Pachif and it's Oliver and me sitting in, in the office, you know, Oliver, yeah, whatever. <laughs> And uh, we had this little, you know, TV and a video uh, recorder in it. So we put the video cassette in there. I still get goosebumps. <laughs> and it's and it's DJ Markey playing our music, and it's literally ten thousand people in in Sao Paulo in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, raving like I've never seen. As like, they do, going As crazy. Do. And this kid is like, you know, scratching and going. I'm like, oh my god, god. what is this? You know. I'm like, this is like, this is just unbelievable. I've never seen anything. And by this time, I'd seen all the DJs in drum and bass. And, and of we course... Was, and we were still kind of yeah, very much underground. We were. So, first of all, I took this idea to Frost and Brian G. And they're like, what do you mean? Brazilian DJs, you know. No one was buying it. No. But I thought, fuck it. You know what? I'm going to go to Brazil. So I got a flight, went to Brazil on my own. And I went to see Marky... Uh, I was staying, actually I stayed with Pachif who was really living in the favela then, like proper, like going off at night. But I was like, what an adventure. I didn't, I didn't even think for one minute like, oh, I could be in danger. I was like, wow, this is incredible, you know. And uh, and obviously how the Latins are and Brazilians very, I mean, they yeah, received me with open arms, yeah. you know. So that was just uh, an amazing experience. But literally I arrived I, I remember very well, I arrived on a Thursday morning and Thursday night, Marky had just sort of started this new residency at a club in Sao Paulo called Love, Lovey Club. It's a very famous club for many years. And there was this guy who's now passed away, sadly, called Angelo Liuzzi, who was a very innovative, forward-thinking guy in Brazil. And he'd seen the same thing, you know. He's like, okay, I'll get this kid out of the favela, I'm going to put him in a club in the rich part of town, you know, the, with the with the wealthier Brazilians live but it worked you know and everyone was blown away but anyway so I, so I went to the club and I saw Marky play and it was just like Ross <laughs> I mean Ross club and then he was yeah it was just like I was I couldn't believe it yeah. I mean it was like and I, I still to, yeah shout out to Marky you know me and Marky we're not close anymore for other reasons but you know, I actually posted it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, this video. We, we've got to give these people their flowers. Bro. No, but listen, you know I mean? love to exactly. Marky. And, uh, and to me, he's still the best DJ I've ever seen in my life. And you can ask Cole Cox. You can ask Pete Tong. You can ask a lot of DJs. They all know him. Like, who's, you know, who's I've asked Cole Cox before. And he said, Marky. Yeah. You know, I used to invite, get Marky to play at Space, you know. But anyway, um, so yeah, so, so I, just, I was like, bro, I've got to, I've got to take you to, to Europe. And he was like, what are you talking about? He didn't believe me at all. You know, Pachif was, and Pachif, bless him, he was, he was also artist, but he was like, no, first take Marky, then we worry about me, you know? So anyway, then literally we, uh, you know, we got Marky plane ticket. I took him to London. He stayed at a house, him and Pachif, because I, I had a flat with Oliver. And he stayed there for a month and I just called up everyone I knew and obviously our own parties. And I remember the first time, Marky played at Mass. Um, I called up Groove Ride. I said, Groove Ride, I'm going to have to put this DJ in just before you. And he wasn't very happy about it. <laughs> and then quite a few people were a bit like, what are you doing, mate? Bringing yeah. this, like, what, you can't just bring him in, you know? Oh, yeah. We you know how that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, trust me. Yeah. Just trust me on this. Yeah. And I really had to put my, yeah. put my foot out there, yeah. you know, and like, trust me. And then when everyone saw him, they were like, fucking okay. hell, mate. You know, and then it was, and then it I would was have off. Love to have seen Ryder after that shit. Yeah, but well, I remember Ryder was just looking at him like, yeah. "Fucking hell!" <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, like, Ryder's Ryder's so deceptive and so yeah, uh, like and, and like and militant. Yeah, you know what I mean. I've seen him remove needles yeah. from DJs. Like, yeah. Yeah, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> but that's the thing. And in, in the beginning, there was obviously a little bit of resistance. Mm. And I remember Marky would play, and he would look at me and Oliver almost like a nod of approval, like, should I like really go for it? And we'd be like, go, go for it. Movie. And then he'd be like, and then he would let rip and it was like the whole place would go. Yeah. And uh, again, goosebumps. Yeah. Like, I remember w the first time we played at mass, people actually got down and started doing this. Right, 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 right. Spontaneously. And, and then I was like, okay, we've got a genius yeah. on our hands. Yeah. 
and and then yeah long story short basically you know everyone did really embrace marky and it, it, it was great it was i think it was great for the scene you know we had this whole explosive thing the brazilian ep you know uh, uh lk which was like a number it got into the number 15 of the uk charts drum and bass song with stamina mc on the vocals it's the way it's the it's exact the way you know that was yeah. all that was all that all came out of movement yeah. that all came out of that whole brazilian thing and us putting it all together you know like v records the brazilian guys and yeah you know fabio groove right there man they gave a lot of support yeah, rest in peace stamina yeah yeah uh andy c you know everyone in the end you know renegade hardwell clayton i mean all these guys everyone everyone of course everyone had their own things but in the end, I think everyone understood that, wow, this is a really unique thing. And and the great thing for me was over the, the years that passed, um, I was then able to bring all the drum and bass guys to Brazil. You know, Andy C, everyone played in Brazil. And drum and bass became literally what you see now when you see, let's say, you know, like some massive techno thing like Solomon or one of those guys uh, DJing. That back then in beginning 2000s that was drum and bass the position of drum and bass in brazil it was like the marquis arena was like when he played it was just i mean you couldn't even get close to it it was just so ram a jam you know and he was doing primetime tv it was just we had done basically what you know like i said like my vision of it which was mainstream but without compromising the sound so it was drum and bass but it was you know, accepted by the mainstream. Of course, as with anything in the mainstream, eventually they get bored of it and things move on. But, um, but yeah, it was an incredible period. And through that, I also eventually, you know, moved to Brazil because I, you know... When Mark, did you move, what, what year did you decide to move? In, 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 in 2002. Okay. So I, you know, I was, I was in, obviously in London still, still doing our stuff. By that time, I must say, I was just getting tired of london you know it's just like i say about it. <laughs> the, yeah and the whole movement thing and a lot of politics and it was just it was wearing me down you know um and it was just t it was kind of tough you know to keep keep going at it and i also wanted something new that's just kind of how i am anyway so then I, one day i just said to oliver my you know my best mate business partner i was like listen i'm going to move to sao paulo i'll set up the, our company there and that's what i did you know, i literally turned up with a suitcase and uh you know, and, and start obviously managing Mark and Pachif and then start managing other artists, um, Anderson Noyes, Renato Cohen, you know, the big artists in Brazil at that time. And the and the other interesting thing was that at that same time, you know, Brazil was really starting to, that whole electronic thing was starting to, to pop. We And uh, I'd met this guy who was my business partner for many years, Luis Orico, and uh, he'd in 99, he started a festival called Skull Beats, which became like the biggest festival actually in 2000 and, what was it now? I can't remember the I year. Did, did 2009. Did Skull Beats in Brazil with Roger Sanchez. Yeah. And about that time, I think. Yeah. No, Roger was there. All, yeah, we booked, it, we booked him a lot. Yeah. We booked him a lot. So, But anyway, so Luis had started this and part of the inspiration, this is interesting as well, was he'd been to Creamfields for the first edition, Homelands. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. So we were involved in Homelands. We did the drum and bass arena, of course. And Luis had been there because I was already connected with the Brazilian guys. It was the home at Leicester Square, wasn't it? Home, that's it. That was a club. Yeah. So Homelands was like the big, the first UK like outdoor festival, certainly in the South. So we were involved in that and a few Brazilians had come over, Luis Rico as well, who at the time owned a really cool club in Sao Paulo. And I, you know, I was already engaging with with the people in sao paulo at this time because obviously mark and Pashif was sort of moving along and um so luis was really inspired by this and he wrote out a project and took it to skull abi uh and they bought it and basically that you know that became skull beats and that festival was so successful that it became a a, a product it was actually the first time that you create an event that becomes a product. It wasn't like, oh, the product exists, let's call it, let's make an event, which is what usually happens, you know? So that, so that was amazing. And then basically, you know, Luis said, hey, you should also stay because I need, I need someone to help me because like, the brand wants to do this. 
this is working uh you know and uh so that was another reason and and that was great and luis is a you know was a, a great guy a great businessman as well I learned a lot from him and that was when i started to branch out much broader you know so by that time we were booking you know deep dish armin van buren uh you know and then everything else david getter steve Van, swedes everyone literally you know and then also taking on brands as well right yeah they were doing um they took on um sensation as well yeah 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 that was that was much later right so i wasn't really involved at that stage but but the skull beats but, but still... skull, no skull beats we did for i think eight nine years yeah. and uh there was one year can't remember exactly the year but it's in the guinness book of records it was the biggest selling dance music event in the world get away yeah but and <laughs> but also because i think it was the year that i think it was the year after that that uh big issues with dance valley so they had to think they had a year off but anyway there's 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 definitely a there's a metric there that i know we were the biggest because we sold sixty thousand tickets for one day which at that time i think it was so more than coachella even you know coachella at that time wasn't there where it is now and by the way marky is the first ever brazilian dj to play at coachella and we you know we took him there it was through the music as a agent at the time steve goodgold is one of the biggest agents in the u.s now who saw again saw that made him you know marky toured a lot in the u.s in the early 2000s you know obviously none of that's really remembered anymore or the fact that he's like you know was the first brazilian to smash uh you know uh coachella i think he's still one of the hardest working djs on the planet yeah you know so so again i mean there's a i mean there's a hundred stories of that of like through drum and bass and 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 being there just being at the forefront at the forefront and that to me is like you know i love seeing now all this new generation of brazilian djs you know getting massive i'm very happy i'm and i'm good with you know i have good contact like with vintage and all these guys well, let's, like, let, i mean let's get let's get to that because yeah now, you know now so you know 2002 you go to brazil yeah Things are kicking off. You're with Skull, Skull, Skull Beats for eight, eight, yeah. eight years. Yeah. So we're talking 2010, and you're now branching. You, you're branching out. Yeah. So when did you decide I'm going to be a manager? <laughs> um, that kind of that did come later because at that time, certainly that beginning, a lot of it was about you know events and tours. Uh, but but by that time, you know, by the end of Skull Beats, um, Luis and me, you know, the company had really grown. Uh, massively it was now at this point a massive agency so we had like and uh, you know we teamed up with some other people but you know we had like 80 artists on the local roster we were touring pretty much every international act in the region you know together with like martin gontad in argentina and a couple of key players in 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 the region you know we had it on lockdown basically um you know for a long time um we had a record label, we, you know, we had everything. And then the management thing, I, I kind of just always did it, but like, let's kind of almost on the side. It's like, I was doing everything for the artist anyway. I was doing the touring, the music, and then yeah, sort of sort of managing, but not, let's say, formally. Um, so that, that, came, that came later, but to be honest, you know, now that's my focus, but also because that's the part I always enjoyed the most, you know, sort of. For me, it's very easy to connect with artists because I think they, you know, first of all, I, I, I don't go like, ooh, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's a person, but I, I admire them, you know? And so I can just talk very straight and I think that works very well with artists, as you know, you know, because artists actually don't like being put up on this pedestal. They like it if someone's just sort of normal and... Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm joking, <laughs> but but deep down, yeah, of, course. of course, of course, when you know when you're the adrenaline and you're turning up backstage and boom, boom, all the lights, of course, everyone laps that up. But in your day to day, yeah, you want people around you who just like you can actually you talk need to the real, then yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's just a thing that I had that I could connect very easily, and so I built up you know a lot of friendships in in the artist community over all those years, and. um just more and more just really enjoyed that part, you know, and just being creative, even like with, you know, Sonny Ryan, who I manage now, my sort of professional relationship started with them when they came to tour in Brazil for the first time. And I'd actually seen them at Extrema 
because uh, I, you know, I was a promoter, so I was I went to see them because Jasper from DLP said, "Oh, you got to check out these guys." So I went to see them, and again with them it was kind of like that marquee moment when I saw those two playing that tribal house. I was like, "Fucking hell, this is amazing!" And I was like, "Wow, these guys are the, these guys have got it." You know, they got that flavor, that sauce that a lot of the other guys don't have or different. But anyway, so I, I was booking them and they, you know, they did all the big shows in Brazil and Tomorrowland and all this stuff. Uh, and we just had a good friendship. I n- never thought anything more of it. Um, and it was really when I came to Holland that, uh, you know, I was just, I reached out to them and the friendship continued and I would just start throwing some ideas at them, you know, just not with any intent. Cause at that time when I moved back to Holland, I was, I was working at IDNC actually. So I wasn't manager mode, you know. But I started throwing ideas and bringing some music and stuff. So that just sort of developed organically, you know. But uh, I think in the end, it's almost like a process of elimination. I've had all the different hats, you know. I've been a promoter. I've been the agent. I've been the touring operator. I've been the the label. I've done kind of, I had all the hats. And by process of elimination and experience and, oh, I like this, I don't like that, you know, come to this point now where I'm like, well, this is what I really enjoy. You know, this is where I can put my experience and my creativity into it. This is where I can get balance, more more balance in my life, you know, which I definitely lost many times along the way. <laughs> well, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> you know, the, this industry is crazy. So if you don't, you know, if you're not really watching you, you, yourself, your mental health, all these things, you know, and uh, I never got like just to be clear that I never got lost in drugs or stuff like that, but just kind of just the consumed with the chaos, the yeah. chaos, the stress, trying to handle the chaos yeah. in mm. itself is, is well, just, you remember, I mean, Tomorrowland Brazil. Well, I, mean, I wanted to get, yeah. get onto that because that's where I, I, I sort of linked up with you sort of again. Yeah. And so th- I remember the announcement, getting the announcement that we were going to Brazil and I, I was, was like, crying my, I was shit. crying my eyes out in the front of house when David was announcing right. it you remember yeah, yeah. I well, had I was, that I'd, I'd been told earlier and, that of course day. and I was like really and they're like yeah 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 we're going to Brazil and I, I like, have a video oh, of shit. you and you you and then obviously David I have that on my phone wicked wicked yeah, I got and, sent it and, to you and think to myself I don't know I don't know Portuguese I don't know Portuguese I don't know yeah. so I was sort of in a panic and but how did that was you was it was that through the skull no skull beats network no, or, or but, yeah, yeah, how, yeah. Was, how did you tie in because it was obviously you know you speak dutch yeah um which was obviously useful uh, useful <laughs> yeah but do you know how that all yeah no 100 percent. i know a lot of people were working a long time to try and get it there yeah so i mean okay the long long the short Luis, version yeah. of it um so Luis my business partner by that time also Silvio Conchon shout to great, Silvio great great geezer um, they were my two partners in the company in, in Brazil called Plus Talent it still exists um, and some of our ex team are now running that which is actually a really nice fabulous yeah, yeah. Um, so the legacy continues but anyway um, in 2014 we started talking to SFX you know and again that thing I told you I saw Shelley Finkel at ADE. Mm. I was like, boom. It was that thing again. That happens every few years with me. And I went, uh, you know, I went to him and uh, Luis was like, ah, oh, mate, it's not, they're not going to fucking buy a company in Brazil. I'm like, they are. They're going to buy everything. They're going to buy everything. And if they're going to buy anyone, it's going to be us because if we, and we, because it wasn't like, oh, we want to sell the company, but no. we're like, where do we go now? Like, we've got to take a step up because we weren't even competing. Have they already bought? Had they already bought? They like, bought a few things. Had they already bought it was, INT? No, it wasn't. It wasn't through yet. So, but the, the so the thing was that you know obviously we saw these you know, what was going on. It was obviously big news in in the, but also in Brazil we were like our competitor was like Live Live Nation. We weren't competing with, let's say, the agencies that today are big in Brazil. We were competing with Live Nation. You Number know, one. Yeah, I mean, at one stage. We did like a David Guetta tour and we sold more hard tickets than any other artist in Brazil that year, you know. So we were like in the in the in the big game. We were in Polestar on ticket sales, you know. Um 
So we were like, well, where are we going to go next? And obviously Tomorrowland was a big thing and we knew that those things were going on. Um, but anyway, again, I then got on a flight, here I go again, to New York. I said, Shelley, can I have lunch with you? You know, And then uh, he's like, yeah, okay. And this was through a few other intermediaries that got that got me there. And um, I remember him sitting down for lunch. And he's like, uh, who are you? And, uh, <laughs> and by the way, why are we meeting? I was wow. like, yeah, because he was just having so many meetings. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, Shelley's yeah. a wonderful guy, okay. you know. But yeah. he was like, he was just very honest. I mean, he was like a, he was a boxing promoter, right? And he's a, you know, you don't mess around with Shelley. He's a great guy, but very straight. So, so yeah, what, why are we actually meeting? I was like, okay, <laughs> Shelley, I'm, you know, I have a company in Brazil. We do this amount of business and we got this festivals and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Send me, send me a pitch, you know. So went back, to sent it, didn't hear anything for a few months. Then bumped into him again at ADE, like random. Shelly, he's like, oh, I thought about you yesterday. Some people were talking about Brazil. And I said, well, let's talk. Now's the time, you know. So anyway, that happened. And the, one of the you know, th reasons that we really wanted that to happen was <clears throat> because we knew Brazil was on the, on the plan for Tomorrowland expansion, you know. And obviously, through the whole IDNT connection with Tomorrowland at the time, And SFX buying IDT, there was a kind of a, that was kind of the, the route to Tomorrowland. But um, so at the same time that we were doing the whole process of selling our company, which is obviously takes time, due diligence, all that stuff, this conversation started with Tomorrowland and, you know, Ritty and uh, key people, obviously Michiel. And, you know, there was several trips out to Brazil um, and we were like, you know, looking at it, studying the possibility And I remember then one one day it was uh, the guys had been there, you know, Michiel and the whole gang had been there for for about a week, and we were at at the international airport in Sao Paulo. <laughs> so squeaking there, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're sitting at a pizza hut. And uh, I remember Michiel looked at me and said, "You think you can do this?" I'm like, "A hundred percent, a hundred percent." There I am again, back in, you know, the Barumba. Yeah, I can do it. You know. And, I, and Ritzy was there, Ritzy from uh, IDNT and uh, Bruno. Anyway, so then the guys, you know, they go off and uh, Luis and me are walking back to the car and Luis looks at me, he's like, are you fucking mad? Mm. Like, <laughs> you really think we can do this? I'm like, I have no idea, Luis, but fuck it, let's try, you know? And that was, that was really it. And then, you know, the next day we're like, wow, we're actually going to try and pull this off. Had you already had the site in it too? Yeah, no, we, that was like the first thing of, you know, the, the team approving that. Had and it been the, used for, had it been used before? Yeah, we'd, we'd used it for experience, gotcha. but we only used like literally what was the campsite. Mm -hmm. That was the only area we'd actually use. So all the, all the rest of it, you know, like the valley, we actually had to build the valley, we right. had to carve it out. I mean, it's crazy shit. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But then we just started, you know, putting the team together. So, um, you know, one of the guys that I was close to, Mario Sergio, he was a young producer at the time doing some shows and I saw a lot in him. And uh, I said, he needs to be our production director. And everyone's like, nah, he doesn't even speak English. I'm like, trust me. <laughs> Again, you know, the marketing, trust me. He's the guy. And now Mario is running Brazil, you know, which... Back again. <clears throat> which to me is like a great Shout feeling. Shout to Mario. Shout to Mario. You know, for, which to me is... It's wonderful. It's great. You know, I love that. that well, it continues <clears throat> the passion for it, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? Because it's a family business. It is. You know, it's a, uh, yeah. now Brazil, you know, Brazil was was that family. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and to now finally get it back after all the dramas, yeah. Yeah. after all the years, it's yeah. just fabulous. Yeah. yeah. So you got yeah. to salute those boys, yeah? No, definitely. So I'm... I'm, I'm So, so I'm happy that it's happening and, and uh, that the legacy continues, you know, because, of course, like... That's all my, matters, right? Yeah, because my sort of role in it, it's like, nobody cares really at this point. That's just the fact of it, you know? But it's it's for me, right? It's for what I take it's, out of it. It's exactly for us, mate. It's, you know, it's exactly for us. So yeah. when I go there in October and I walk around, I'll be like, yeah, I'm the fucking crazy fucker that, that was a massive catalyst in this even being here today, you know? Um, so obviously, we'll be, we'll be hanging out in the in the feng, feng shui garden. hundred percent, uh, right? <laughs> and I'll be a lot less stressed than I was, <laughs> you know, when we, when we did it. So, so yeah, that was and that was full circle, you know. To be honest, like, um, you know, but so by that time, 
that's like 2015, you know, first edition sold out in 30 minutes. You know, I mean, we were the, the God's bollocks, you know, with all due humility, you know, we had a massive office, 60 staff, all the tours, everything. And I remember one day, actually, I remember vividly, I had a really nice corner office and we just sold out Tomorrowland and, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're feeling like top of the up world. top of the world. Yeah. But I remember sit, going to my office and just having this sinking feeling like, what's next? You know, and I, I mean, I've always been like that. You know, I moved around a lot as a kid. Every sort of two, three years I'd be, you know, my dad said, would say, right, we're off and I'd have to start again. So I've I've got that, you know. I kind of go somewhere and I'm very intense about it. But then when when the job's done, so to speak, where the cycle's complete, I'm like, right, what's next, you know? And so I had that feeling, you know, even though I was like top of the world. I mean, it couldn't honestly couldn't get any bigger and it wasn't it was like how I'd again envisioned it is what happened. And then but when I got there, you know, that's my learning now. It's like it sounds a bit cliche, but it's really not about the the the, the destination. It's it's really about the journey, you know. And I didn't enjoy the journey at all. I can't remember hardly anything. All right. You know, I'm t- I'm talking details here, but missing it. So, you know, I meet people like you, and people are like, oh, you remember this? I'm like, fuck, I can't remember anything. I'm saying even Tomorrowland. It's like you know, I, I went great because of the stress and there's so much stuff that Luis and me went through. Just to make it happen. Not even that. I didn't realize it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so much stuff that we had to take on because we were, you know, the local promoters that, you know, stuff that I didn't even bother me heal with, you know. You know, just, you know, you can just imagine a a festival like that in Sao Paulo and everything that you can imagine that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that that. Well, I don't think. people do imagine no exactly and, and it doesn't matter it's not for them it, you know it's they're there to have a good how time many, and how many people have to be paid off <laughs> <laughs> i mean just that alone isn't it right it's well know. yeah i mean listen it's not these days it's not that bad but I, I, so i'll give you a funny story about that so we were literally like when you do a big festival just before um you have to get the license right so i mean and literally you have like multi-million dollar festival and the license only gets actually signed off the day before jesus you know so talk about risk right so there's obviously a whole process where it's kind of like okay it's done deal but there's still the actual physical walk around with the inspectors and blah 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 so that was happening and the fire inspector says there's no fire escapes and we're like what do you mean it's like open fields (laughs) if the you know if something goes on fire people can just you know it's like there's no lack of space here. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere. No, no, no. But you need to have clearly defined fire exits. Mm. So cut long story short, and I, you won't even remember this, but we had open fields and there was there was obviously some fencing, but there was actually those, you know, those fire escapes you have in clubs? We had to put those every certain amount of meters. Know, so, yeah. And he's like, but don't worry. Here's a telephone of my cousin. He'll get it done for you. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> so like... The night before we're about to open, you know, the festival, we have to basically, yeah. you know, negotiate with like the, the fire fireman. exit, the fire exit guy. <laughs> Just pay the family off. Pay yeah. the family off, son. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, those are those are funny stories that you laugh about now, but yeah, I mean, we we you got to get Mario in here one day because he'll tell you <laughs> so many stories about like uh, so you know, 2015. Yeah, 2015. You get the sinking feeling. Yeah. Um. 2016, you're still in Brazil? I'm still in Brazil. Country's failing, right, at this time? Yeah. Uh, Dilma has been impeached. Uh, currency's gone to shit. Our budget's, you know, messed up because we, you know, we have a lot of, like, uh, obviously international costs, you know, uh, artists, production. Was there any panic at, at, at that point? There wasn't panic because, you know, we, we'd sold well and stuff, but we knew, like, okay, this is a challenge. But, again, the, the, the issue's not the challenge, you know. Um, it was more like, okay, the biggest problem, to be honest, at that point was SFX was going bankrupt. So SFX owns our company. And then through all these turmoil, you know, we needed support, financial support. So I was calling New York like, hey, this is your company. And they're like, yeah, we haven't got any money. We're bankrupt. So try and fix it yourself. 
So I mean, uh, uh, you know, again, it's a movie like me and Luis on a, you know, with his, uh, you know, having these phone conferences, like shouting at these people, and they're like, oh, there's no money, you know. So basically, we had to figure it out ourselves. And I, I, I'd actually had a plan for myself to leave Brazil because I thought I've done my job. I've got a great team, success. I'm, you know, I've, I've just won sort of, you know, the the Champions League, like great time to bow out right and of course at, was you thinking of planning a young family at this time or was your no, i already had a family so i yeah i had my kids and uh and i did think i was already had been thinking about going to holland you know because my parents lived there or 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 possibly like yeah, the states the Oma and Oma. yeah like, exactly yeah, yeah. so and also just to give them a different perspective but more importantly because i just felt like i'd done my full cycle like i wasn't really I wasn't coming in with the energy and the ideas and there was a whole new generation that, f- that, w- that we'd built up that I felt could do that, you know, like Mario, you know, who's done it. He's like, he's the man now in Brazil. He's kind of like, you know, what I was doing five, six years ago, he's doing now, you know, he's got the venue, the artists, everyone calls him, you know, he gets, he, he, he gets, gets it, he done. gets shit done. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so, but because of this turmoil, I basically had to stay, you know, so, and then the, lo- the next sort of couple of years were really tough because we were basically bankrupt. You know, I had people turning up at the office with guns saying, where's my fucking money? You know, that's not, that's not nice, you know? By the way, that happens in London as well. Not just <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, so there was a, it was a definitely uh, a, a tough time and it took its toll, you know, on me, uh, took, took its toll on my relationship with, with Luis, just the pressure. You know, we're still f- friends, but yeah, it's definitely... You know, it definitely had a, a lasting impact. impact. Yeah, yeah, of course. And in the end, you know, the company just, you know, we just couldn't keep it going. I mean, it just ran out. Of, we just ran out of resources, energy, and everyone, you know, it's all about energy, right? So the artists felt it, so artists start, started to leave, you know, and uh, and then eventually I was like, when I, when I felt things were under control and we'd got the company back, let's say, healthy. Yeah. You know, that's when I said, you know, sat down with my partners and said, guys, you know, I've got a, that's it for me. I'm out, you know. And, uh, and, and literally that was it. I mean, I walked away from the company and they actually. Was that 2017? 17, yeah. SFX actually gave the company back to Luis. Wonderful. And, uh, and then they even said, hey, do you want to, you know, come back to it or be a, be a partner again? And I was like, nah. This is this is done for me now, you know. And um, but again, just great memories, and you know, I mean, Lived I it. think, yeah, I mean, the you know, my legacy in Brazil, I'm proud of it. I still love it. I'm going next week. You know, obviously, I've got artists, clients there now, and, and your still, wife, with your wife is Brazilian, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, Brazil is like massive to me still, and I'm still very connected with well, it's home as well. Yeah, no, it? actually, it's, it feels more home than Holland. I can understand yeah, that, to yeah, be fair. Yeah. <laughs> no, it does. But that's also because I grew up in South America. So, I, you know, I'm not, well, you know that. I don't need to tell you, but I'm not a typical Dutch guy no. culturally or in any way. I'm proud of my Dutch heritage, but, yeah, it's just it's just different for me. And um, But, yeah, I mean, then I moved to Holland. And to be honest, I didn't really have a plan. And, um, you know, and, and to be fair... When I got there, the guys in ID and T, because there was obviously still a connection. You know, ID and T was part of the same group. SFX is plus talent, so we were kind of family. <clears throat> so then, when I, you know, decided to move to Holland, they were very receptive. They said, oh, "Just come and come and work with us." You know, he's a tape. You know, he's a desk. Literally, you can come and just do whatever you want to do. And so I started working a bit with like Mystery Land, helping them out. And before I knew it, I was back in it. You know, <laughs> and and the guys in in LA that the owners of SFX, they're like, you're going to become the CEO of ID and T. And I did, you know, I shouldn't have done it, <laughs> but they, they were like, yeah, you got to do it. So here I am. I was, I was looking for like peace and tranquility. And all of a sudden I'm flying up and down to yeah. LA and I'm dealing with all the different founders of ID and T and just trying to understand ID and T as a company and, Culturally, I'm completely in the wrong place, you know, completely like a fish out of water. And um, and I don't mean that in a negative way because everyone there was really, really great to me. You know, I wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that 
uh, a negative experience. It was just a very, just very. I couldn't, I couldn't find myself, yeah. you know. And that also, I, it all kind of really tuned out. Exactly, and also, I'd always built my own things, and all of a sudden, you you step into somebody else's yard. It's different, and they've got a vision for how it needs to be. And of course, I've got my idea, and that's when I did have a big clash after about a year and a half of that, and I basically set a plan for ID and T. And, you know, a lot of people didn't agree with it. And I said, well, then you need to find somebody else because, you know, it's like, what's the point? Like, this is my vision. Fair enough, it's not your vision. I don't own it. Then, So then I literally sat at home for six months. And, uh, you know, because I had a contract, of course, and just trying to, you know, wait and see what happened. And, it, again, it wasn't a negative thing. It was just like, okay, let's just figure out. And then eventually they said, well, you know, we know you really like the artist stuff. Why don't we do, why don't we do that together? The management thing. So that's, uh, and that's, you know, and, and that's how it started. So the first step was really, I did a joint venture with id t for about a year. But then after a year of that, we had a pe- pandemic and all that stuff. And I said, guys, let's just call it a day. You know, let me just, I'll just go and do my thing. We're still friends and we are, and we, you know, I, I get a lot of support from id t and, still great relationships there but i just said you know now nah, i just need to just do my own thing and they were you know they were receptive about it and and that's when um i came up with this fearman and now it's it's literally back literally back to where i started you know in london back in the day just me well at the time i had oliver my, my business partner best mate as my partner so now it's just me but now my vision is also like now I've got a few people working for me and the first conversation I had with them was like, you know, why do you want to work with me? Right. Oh yeah. Cause they're into music guys, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, I'll tell you what, it's probably the conversation you won't have in your first job interview, but I'm telling you right now, if you go for it, I'll give you equity in my company. Cause what I want to do is build a new, you know, management company, that has, you know, my vision, but I'm open to ideas. But I want to build it for the future, you know. Like one of my sons is really into music. I'd love it if he got into it. Doesn't have to, but, you know, if he w- wants to work hard, he can get into it. And the people that <clears throat> that are in it now, that are working for me, they have an opportunity, you know, to own it, you know, to own it. Because I don't need to own everything, you know. I just want to be involved in it and be relevant where I can be relevant. Uh, it's, and it's, pay the bills and pay the bills but also understand where you are you know I'm not 20 anymore I'm not at the cutting edge of I know I look it <laughs> <laughs> you do, don't look too bad you don't look too bad but I'm not you know I'm not at the cutting edge of anything so you got to understand where you're at yeah. right but you can still be in this industry extremely useful and relevant and I feel I am you know with my eyes I have experience network I can tell them like don't do this do that you know or I can you know guide them through stuff but they, you know, in the end, it's still them. It's their career. They're the creatives. They, they have the vision. I've just got to protect it. And the same with the team. It's like young people that have the drive and energy. They just need guidance, you know. So I, I, I love that, that role. I love being in that phase. Well, it's, it was funny because I remember our conversation. We were talking. I'm not going to go into the the, the, the whole uh, madness of the pandemic, but you know, we we were saying it gave you a chance to take a look take a step back and say look do you really need to be doing 200 shows a year you know do yeah. you really need to be doing 500 shows you know like yeah. think about what you you're doing to yourselves exactly you know let's let's choose and 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 be so you know it turns out for the creatives that whole madness was a blessing in disguise yeah you know for a lot of things did you find that as well with yourself obviously you yeah definitely it was the first time i actually stopped and reflected about everything that had happened and uh and i and i <clears throat> to be honest just before i i did think about completely stopping you know i was just sort of <clears throat> disillusioned and tired of it and uh i thought you know what i'm just gonna go and do something else but didn't really know what fine <laughs> Spelt wrong, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it definitely, it definitely, you know, got me thinking a lot, and then and then it actually got me like writing down my sort of vision of things, you know, 
and like, okay, how do, if I'm going to stay in this, how do I want it to, what, what it needs to look like today? Not my mega ambitious 20 year old who wanted to like, you know, own the, the, the fucking world. I don't need that anymore. You know, back then I was like, if you'd seen me back then, I was like unstoppable. I mean, and militant about it as well. Yeah. I was like, like that, you know? Um, so now it's just, yeah, you just want different things. And now I'm back in my love for music, which is what, what, what I really enjoy. You know? And I love seeing that in the artists, you know, like, I mean, Sonny Ryan are really an amazingly creative process. And it's great seeing that. And I've just, I've been encouraging that, you know, when I started with them, like properly managing, I said, fuck everything, forget everything. What everyone's ever told you, just go into the studio and find yourselves, your, your sound, your voice. You've got it in you. Like, just, find it you know and it's coming out like in droves and you know and all of a sudden it's all happening it's kind of like the, the you know the fundamentals of the debut album is a perfect as, as as much as they've been busy for for a decade already yeah you know if not longer that or at least you know huge status in the last decade yeah you know, that that fundamentals being their debut album gives it that nice newish platform for yeah. them to go off and do do that because they have you've had to have been especially if you're kind of in and around the edm festivals you yeah. have to be you have to have had a certain sound yeah which is relevant to what you know the getters and the garrix yeah. are playing in the world yeah but you still want to be your own it's self and exactly. I think that's exactly how they found themselves with that fundamentals so i hope yeah. they keep doing that no know? but they're more and more going into the, into their strength in that way if you look at for example well, that's really where they came from anyway yeah but uh, and I think more and more they're just getting that confidence. If you see, you know, we we were there. Let's say the main stage Tomorrowland Winter. You know, they played a set which you probably hear in a club. And they played it on the main stage and they made it work. You know, so that takes balls to do that to play certain records that you know are not. Let's say Especially the easiest. You've only got an hour as well. Yeah, but they're not the easiest. But then you can still put it together in a way that the energy is infectious and everyone gets into it you know so that's that's one of their unique things and that's what i've been pushing them on like forget some of those old records used to play you know because people were telling you you should play it just do your thing there'll be it you know and so they they're definitely completely about that now and that's great to see i don't listen i don't tell them what to play or what to make at all zero you know never when dream of it they know that much a hundred times better than me. I can see Ryan telling you fuck off anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's like, piss off, mate. <laughs> exactly. So you'd be like, what? And Ryan yeah. left my cough. <laughs> yeah. So that's not, that's not, yeah. that's not, and, and no. in fact, that's never the job. No, the manager. So you've never been like that anyway, have you? No. no. But it's more just like, maybe you might come and go, yo, <laughs> listen to that. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's really about protecting the vision of, of the artist, you know. And my, what I try and is, who, who, who else is with you now? So I've got uh, obviously Sonny Ryan, uh, Cat Dealers from Brazil, and Bruno Martini from Brazil. Obviously, two you know massive artists there. Cat Dealers in in the, in the US, huge. So uh, you know a lot going on there. And I've shout, signed shout out to the boys, yeah, yeah. And I've signed two new artists. One is QG, it's a hip hop R and B uh, singer songwriter uh, out of Manchester. And then, oh, I love what's coming out of Manchester yeah. right now. And he's like. I mean, uh, we have huge uh, ambitions for him, you know. He's an amazing talent. And the great thing is the way that I'm doing it now as well, like obviously Sonny and Ryan are also involved in that. So they play like an executive role. Cool. So they're actually producing a lot of the stuff. Nobody knows that. <clears throat> but it lets them kind of use their other creative mm. uh, ideas for something that's not theirs, you know, because as Sonny and Ryan, they're probably not going to, release a you know a sort of hip-hop record you know never you say, never know never say never but right now probably not no you know if they wanted to fine but so that's the, you know so that's really great how you can then involve everyone and that's also one of the things that i want to do with with the company now is you know let's say legacy artists like sonny ryan get them a lot more involved also in in new talent you know and there's a few young artists that we're developing together at the moment you know so they you know, they have a vision for, for music, they have a vision for creative, and I have a vision for the business side, you know, and that's obviously, you know, um, <clears throat> where I come in and try and set up a business, you know. Model. 
business model exactly for the artists as well you know like okay let's think about your future you know what's what are your assets you know you can't just give everything away you got to own shit mm. otherwise you've got nothing so okay how are we gonna build a strategy where you you know develop your brand you actually own you know your masters your rights all these kind of things you know and um so that's kind of how my my approach to it and um you know and the thing with the thing with fearman and this was like going back to your question about the pandemic so fearman is a really old ancient name it's about 500 years old in in and it comes from katwijk which is where my family comes from originally van down from the dunes kind of makes sense so fearman was actually the name of uh, the fuhrman who was the guy who used to stand at the top of the hill no. putting the fire so the boats could have safe passage to the harbor so when I found that out, when I researched it, I was like, well, yeah. that's me, you know? I mean, that's my purpose. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. my purpose is, uh, you know, lighting guiding. The guiding the way. Yeah, yeah, lighting the way. I mean, not trying to blow my own trumpet, yeah. but guiding. No, but sometimes you need to, just so people yeah. know that what you're trying to do. do but you know? that's my thing. That's where I get, I do that I like with, with my family. I do it with my friends, you know, um, that's just who I am. Again, I'm not saying I'm better or anything. It's just, you know, people are different and I'm, I'm a giver and I'm, that's where I get the most out of my life is when I know I can help. So, and then, listen, I'm not, I'm not like some charitable guy who's helping. Don't <laughs> Make get, no mistake. Don't get, no, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not like this, you know, <clears throat> none of that. I'm not trying to really not trying to, you know, but, but when I'm, let's say engaged with someone or an artist or, or a person, then that's a role that I, generally undertake and I, and I enjoy that the most you know I like you know like I say like seeing someone like Mario in Brazil is now fucking running shit yeah, I like to see people. I love that yeah. I love turning up to his show and he's like of course he's looking after me yeah. you know and I'm like I'm part of I'm part of your legacy yeah and that just for me that's enough you yeah. know yeah no, I, so, I salute you for that mate I you know that. and that's just yeah just I, I love that feeling you know so yeah. I, I want more, more of that and uh, yeah, well, we still got we still got a few years left in you. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. All right, listen. So you know, maybe have we gone over? To, we, no, no. Oh. yes, we have gone over, but that's irrelevant. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, you know, sort of trying to keep it with, uh, you know, keep it within the system. <laughs> 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 to let you roll over. Um, but on the spot questions, yeah, right, just just so yeah. we can wind it down. Um. What's been your favourite organisation to work with? My own. Cool. Um, yeah. Brazil, yeah. Yeah. Plus. What's your best favourite show to date? Uh, I think I've got to say overall Tomorrowland Brazil. I mean, all things considered, really. 2015. Yeah. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. Favourite DJ. Now you can have three. Oh, three? Okay, that's kind of, it's quite easy for me, actually. Marky. Sonny Ryan, Carl Cox. Super. Favourite food? I love uh, Brazilian feijoada, you know, rice, beans, grilled chicken salad, just very typical Brazilian um, basic, I mean, it's not basic, but, you know, traditional Brazilian food. I can eat that every day. Do you cook it yourself? Uh, I'm not great at cooking it myself, no, but... Uh, Luckily, I've, there's people in the family. My son, one of my sons is really into that as well. But uh, yeah, just, uh, and in Brazil, like you have- Are you a fried egg man and spaghetti what? bolognese? Not really. Okay. Nah. Do you cook? No, I do. Yeah. But not amazing. Okay. Carbonara, you know. Ste okay. Steak, uh, rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The basics. <laughs> and I do a pretty the good- essentials. Yeah, and I do a pretty good spaghetti. How long was you a bachelor for? A bachelor? Yeah. Uh, How old was you when you got married? I was quite young. I was thirty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you would have been. You would have been out on your own, living off pot noodles. Mate, I, le I left home London. when I was seventeen, in a good way. Not like I didn't yeah. get thrown out or anything. But <laughs> no, I've always been, you know, looking after myself. So yeah. uh, my 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 wife's an amazing chef, and so she actually got me into like eating properly. You know. Yeah. yeah. He was uh, a Mackie man, was he? Nah, it was just like pizzas and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. just yeah, crap McDonald's. food. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, favorite holiday spot? Favorite holiday spot? Sorry, but Brazil again. Well, listen, funny enough, I'm 
trying to think about taking the family down to Brazil yeah. for a holiday and then encapsulating sort of the last weekend of the... Oh, yeah. Taking in the festival. Well, it's a good time. So... Um, low, low season, you should go to like Salvador or up up, up north a bit, you know. Okay. Yeah, but, get uh, like Pataya, a... Pataya. Someone told me about Pataya or something. Balea? Yes. That, uh, that's a beach. That's like yeah. a two-hour drive. Yeah, from Sao Paulo, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where okay. I used to go but every, some, every, uh, every weekend. Right, but a friend of mine said he's got a cabin out there, I'm saying. Good friend. Okay. Yeah, All take right. him up on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can literally just hire a car and drive down. Right. It's like a two-hour drive. Okay. I mean, when I lived there, that's what every weekend we were at the beach, you know, with the, with the boys and yeah. when I wasn't working. So. And the weather's... Decent at that time of the year, still. Stop. It? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's got to be, mate. Got tomorrow <laughs> I'm going on. <laughs> we'll we'll talk yeah, to the gods. Be fair, mate. You know, I mean, you can yeah. put a festival on in July and be rained out for three days, fam. You know, what I mean? yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Now, it, uh, now October is definitely nice again. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah it's good. Um, when you're not buzzing around everywhere, what's your favourite thing to do? Um, I love sort of being on my own, actually. So I like just sort of going for walks or sometimes I just like, let's say, walk around Amsterdam or... Daydreamer, you're a daydreamer. Bit, yeah, I just put my music on and just walk around, love doing that and uh, love going to the gym. It's like, for me, it's like, I've always gone, but I've always been on and off and now I've sort of really got into it and it's like, it's basically my mental health medicine. If I don't do it, my mind starts going the wrong way. So I've got, I'm very acutely aware of these things. You know, I don't, never been a big drinker or anything, but I hardly ever drink anymore. Like all these things you start really paying attention. So for me, it's all, it's all about, I want to, you know, go into the day optimized. And so I try and now. Do I live forever? No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> no. As long as possible though, right? Yeah. Just be, uh, and be active. You know, I don't want to be like this old guy who's like, you know, got no energy because... Having to be moved around by people. Exactly. Yeah. Then I'd rather... I don't know, I might just pester some people and just <laughs> just live as long as they are 99. Yeah, 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 I'll be here in the corner. It's him stretch. Yeah, yeah come and move me to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't no, want to be one of those. No, no. And, and also... Oh, I maybe don't, not. Oh, I don't know. And also, I don't think I'll ever stop working. Whatever I do. You know, there's a few other things that I, I'm developing, like interests, you know. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not the guy that's going to retire and sit at home. You know, or just play golf and do nothing. Like that would that would be the end of me. You know, that would literally. Be, yeah, that would be the signs that yeah. you're falling off. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so if, and ever I, get, and if I, ever I get a call from you, you fancy around the golf? Be like, what? Yeah, <laughs> on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> You'd be like, all right, this guy's going the wrong way. But and mm-hmm. I, and I've been, you know, I'd, I'd got to that point as well, where you know, when your business is running well, you got a team. And you're just like, all right, I'll just go take a three-hour lunch now, you know? And uh, and again, but that's not... For me, that doesn't work. So no. For some people, it works, but... Um, what's in the car? What you got in the car right now? What are you listening to in the car? In the car right now? I'm actually... It's, I listen to a lot of different stuff, but funnily enough, I just found this old... This old... I found this recording on Spotify of uh, The Police, live, 2008, uh, River Plate Stadium in Argentina. And it's, it's a crowd noise. Uh, there, isn't it? And I, I'm a drummer, Everyone's right? Singing along to yeah. It. So I'm a drummer. So I love some of this kind of rock stuff. And Stuart Copeland was one of my favorite drummers. And if you hear the the drums on that recording, I, I'm listening to the music. But I'm not even listening to the music. I'm listening to the drums, like what he's doing, the triplets, and all, all that. I'm a I'm a drum yeah, nerd. class, really. You know, and I start. I can hear. I know what he's doing, and I know that. I've read this before that like he used to clash a lot with Sting and, and uh, Andy Summers because they'd be like, why are you making all this complicated shit? But that was his expression of himself, you know, it's like all these intricacies. If you go back and listen to police records, yeah, like what he's doing like, yeah, on the hi hats, and it's like, it's like a painting. To me, it's like a painting. Like, it's all these little details that if you just took a quick look, you wouldn't notice them. But if you zoom in, you're like, fucking hell, yeah. you are next level. You know? yeah. So, yeah. I, that's, yeah. how I, that's how I get into the music. Obviously you know? a big Prince fan growing up then as well. A, a police fan growing up. Yeah, but you know what? Not that much, to be honest. It's just Stuart Copeland, well, the oh, drummer. Because you would have been travelling, you would have been living in, in South America. Right? Yeah, yeah, so I wasn't, I wasn't, I definitely wouldn't say I was a big, big police fan. I was just, but yeah, but, you know, musically I, I do listen to everything. I mean, I kind of get into... Who's your favourite drummer? Um, 
when I was a kid, my dad took me to see Art Blakey, mm. legendary jazz drummer who's, who's passed away. He used to do this thing where he used to... Unbelievable stuff. So, yeah, him against Stuart Copeland. Um, the guy, there was a guy from uh, Simple Minds, Mel yeah. Gaynor. Okay. You remember Simple Minds, yeah. the band? I never remember the, the, the yeah. Front Boys. Anyway, there was a, a, a mainstream band, but again... The drumming, like the intricacies of the drumming, was like crazy. I remember Peter Chris from the from Kiss. Yeah, yeah, the drum. yeah. Peter Chris on the drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he was. Ca- I thought he was kind of basic, you know. But uh, right, yeah. No, I was never really. Yeah, but no. So yeah, a few of these kind of drummers, and there was a lot of. I would have one shot, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of session drummers like Omar Hakim and these kind of you know virtuosos that yeah. I and I used to take drumming very seriously. My so I started at the beginning of our conversation. I, I just jumped into my twenties, but when I was twelve, to, you know, in, in my early years, my thing was I want to be, you know, musician, a, a musician. And I did it for many years. And I had a, you know, I even had a band with with Oliver, who's my schoolhood schoolhood uh, childhood friend from school. And we had a band, and we actually did, you know, we won some competitions, and we were doing quite well, um, but. I remember my dad telling me, well, he asked me the question once, he's like, I know you're into drumming, but are you prepared to like, you know, basically suffer for it, like go hungry? Because if you do, fine, go for it. But if you're not prepared to, you know, suffer. to suffer in that way, and that was, a, and it was a good advice because I thought about it. I thought, I love it, but I don't love it enough. And I, And to be honest, I didn't enjoy the spotlight, you know? I think that's a good, that's, but that's a good, that's a good marker for 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 for, for the young people coming yeah. up now, yeah. right? It, that's exactly that line. Yeah. Do you love it? Yeah. Or it, you're really ready to sacrifice yeah. your life? Exactly, because it's not just because about love's not enough. No. In anything in no. life, actually, but yeah, can you can you can you take it? Because to get there, it's 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 hard, you know, and we see instant success all the time on socials and everything used to isn't it it's like everything's immediate but come on everyone who's top dog now go back to tice get a every sonny ryan every all those guys mate they've worked you know skrillex i mean you name it they haven't just come up popped out of nowhere they've worked fucking hard to get where they got to you know look at michiel and tomorrowland organization how they started what they've been through and where they're now I mean, sacrifice, hard work, determination, never giving up. That's the only way. I don't think there's there's no there's no flukes. I don't believe in that. You know. Oh yeah, I made it. I'm still winging it. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not like you know, <clears throat> like crypto millionaires. Is to, that's you know that's a one in the. It's a myth, and it's like a it's fucking myth. Thing. So that kind of what I'm saying, it's not about. I'm saying that it's all right popping up and having it and having it for a moment, but you try and stay there for 25 years, 30 years. Exactly, and that's a lesson that I've learned. Yeah. It's not about being like massively successful; it's about staying in the game. Yeah, and if yeah. you can do that, stay in the lap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is if you can stay. Well, listen, I, in, I'm gonna, in the game. I'm gonna. We'll, we'll finish on the. So I'm giving you the keys to the world, right? Okay. I've killed Bill Gates, and I'm, <laughs> give, I'm giving you the world's responsibility. Yeah. What, what are you gonna do? What am I gonna do? Yeah. I'm going to sit, I'm going to get all those people together. So I've got the key, right? Yeah. So I've got, yeah, I'm going to get, I'm going to get all these leaders together in a room and we're just going to bash it out. We're just going to bash it out. And I mean, the tech leaders, the medical leaders, the world leaders, all, everyone that, that's really spark the punch, driving, driving the agenda and, it's all a bunch of agendas, conflicting agendas, you know. I'm going to get them all in a room. I'm going to bring in some of my old heavies from South <laughs> London. <laughs> going to go back to jungle, jungle ways and we're going to bash it out until everyone's like on the same page, you know. That's what I would do. <laughs> and I would, up yeah. up <laughs> and, yeah. um, my brother. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Absolute yeah. pleasure. Um, yeah, so please uh, tell everybody, uh, like, subscribe, do all of that stuff. Um, discount code, 
on the Mad for the Family, 10%. Please make sure to go and check it out. And um, we've got a few more podcasts coming up. We're going to be pausing for the summer because it's chaos and Tice is uh, way overworked. So we might even be giving it a new face and we'll be getting in hopefully a lot more artists as well. So um, please be sure to subscribe, stay with us and share it worldwide. Thank you very much, Edo. The man. Salute, brother. Thank you.